uh, good morning from the UK um, and or from whatever time zone you're uh, joining from. Uh, I see we've already got uh, some people saying hi in the chat. That's good to see. So we've got Portugal, Australia, fantastic. Um, right, so it'd be good if uh, some of the others who are here could say hi. Tell me, uh, tell me where you're from. It's always nice to know the uh, breadth um, from which we're uh, from which we're getting people joining. Let me bring the uh, bring the slides on up. Okay. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Hello, all. All right. So we'll just go ahead and uh, give a quick uh, a quick overview of what we're going to be covering today. So a little bit of the fundamentals of surface metrology and the parameters we use to define surface shape and form. Um, a little bit about uh, surface mechanical properties, focusing on uh, nano indentation in particular, um, coating adhesion and thickness determination um, as well. And then finally, looking at different characterization methods, spectroscopy methods for characterizing various surfaces. So uh, one thing, this will not be an exhaustive um, you know, and extremely detailed look at all of these methodologies. You know, we only have a limited amount of time here today, and each one of these topics could be its own, uh, could be its own lecture or workshop. So, uh, you know, just please be aware of that um, as we're going through. If you do want some more information, we do. You know, uh, please feel free to go ahead and and type in the chat. Uh, it's always good to uh, it's always good to get some. Uh, uh, some feedback from the audience. If there are any questions I can answer as I'm speaking, I will I will do so. Uh, otherwise, I will mark those questions. We'll have uh, we'll have two Q and A sessions. One directly following uh, the delivery of my material. Um, I will then do a quick review of uh, the capabilities of the two Brooker instruments that we're going to be looking at: um, the Contour X500 and the uh, Hyzotron TI 980, so the white line inter interferometer and nano indenter respectively. Um, after we've had the demos for that, we will have a final Q&A session there uh, so we can clear up any other questions um, from previous and also um, to deal with any uh, instrument specific ones. Okay, so before we begin properly, um, I would quite like to just release a, a quick poll question here just to to see what stage of the career uh, of your career you are all at so as we're uh oh fantastic thank you all for uh uh for answering that looks like we've got a excuse me a nice a nice split here uh, a few uh a few more postdocs than previous that's an interesting to see thank you so Beginning on surface structure, um, what we have here is a nice diagram from uh, Barat Bouchon's Modern Tribology Handbook, uh, talking detailing typical surface structure. Uh, typically, we start with physisorbed and chemisorbed layers. Um, essentially, any kind of surface chemical interaction will produce these. Uh, a chemically reacted layer itself, the amorphous bilby layer, and then the heavily deformed and lightly deformed layer, typically under mechanical contact. Um, but these, this is specific to the material. If you have something that has not seen mechanical contact, you know we typically won't have, or we'll have less of these deformed layers. Uh, we have surface texture, which sits on top of that, the actual form um, of the surface. Uh, and this could be dependent upon the material itself, any wear induced on the surface, uh, material preparation. And of course, materials can be crystalline uh, or they can be amorphous, which we'll deal with a little bit when we get to the spectroscopy part of this. Um, so surface metrology itself, uh, essentially the uh, techniques and theories that we use uh, to measure uh, surface physical surface form. So a lot of this uh, lies in signal processing. Um, one of the things we need to do is to actually define the center line of the surface, effectively virtually flattening it. Um, and then we can look at the various different parameters and ways to measure that. So waviness, roughness, and lay, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, 
This could be done in either a 2D or 3D form. Um, either taking a single line scan is in terms of 2D. So we get our, our Z height and then our length along. Or as we see here, this, uh, this uh, sort of demonstration surface here. And one thing to be one thing that is particularly important is the length scale on which you are measuring, um, because you can get there's an element of what's called fractality. Um, the closer you look, the more similar details you might see. Um, so the length scale at which you measure, um, at which you take your surface metrology measurements, is very important. Um, so one thing is just to be aware of your sampling length when doing so. Um, and one thing you should probably report when you're um, when you're talking about what type of measurements you have. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. So getting to surface parameters, we begin with surface texture. So this is the essentially the form uh, or the pattern formed on the surface by various different irregularities. The we call in tribology the asperities, the sort of uh, the peaks on the surface. We have both peaks and troughs. Um, so this is the overall pattern. Then at the very largest level, we have lay, which is the orientation of the surface pattern. So this is very much, um, this is very much influenced by the type of, uh, type of machining methods used to finish the surface. Uh, we then have waviness, um, on the larger scale. So relatively low frequency undulations up to the order of millimeters and then roughness. So these much higher frequency, shorter wavelength irregularities on the surface. So this is this is very much where we can get to, we can continue, you know, if you have the correct instrumentation to continue zooming in and seeing some of this fractality. And you can see this somewhat in this uh, diagram here. Uh, going to various roughness parameters. Uh, there are so many roughness parameters that are used uh, typically. Um, I think when I was when I was looking before, I found there are, there are roughly, uh, if you pardon the pun, sixty or so parameters that are commonly used. Um, there are, are two here that are most common um, and probably give you the most information about um, about uh, surfaces. Uh, those being RA centerline roughness and root mean square roughness, um, but uh, somewhat amusingly, this is this is somewhat of an issue in metrology because it's it it there are a, an absolute glut of parameters, um, some of which are are quite difficult to you know or quite difficult to implement or you know it's it's um, somewhat difficult to find a specific case for these. Some people simply invent parameters, use those, but then it just adds to the list. Um, but RA um, is typically the most common ones you'd see in any type of research paper. So the mean value, the departure of the profile above and below the center line. So essentially we define our center line through the profile and then it's the mean value of both the peaks and troughs um, from that center line. And then we have essentially the root mean square of that um, throughout the sampling length. So both of these are quite good parameters to use and are relatively uh, relatively informative um, of your surface roughness. There are others such as skewness and um, yeah, and various others. Um, so if you feel you require those, uh, I won't detail them here. You can look into them. Uh, so measurement of surface form itself. Uh, we can have contact and non-contact methods. So for extremely large things, for looking at the actual, for uh, very large objects, you have things like quarter measurement machines, stylus profilometry, such as the uh, tally surf, um, smaller, uh, um, smaller uh, stylus profil uh, profilometers, like atomic force microscopy. We're getting even smaller than that. Scanning tunneling microscopy, if you want to be able to image individual atoms. And then non-contact methods such as white white and confocal microscopy. Uh, I'll detail the function of the or the way that these work a little bit uh, later. So since we're going over surface uh, surface metrology, um, what I'd like to 
sort of know is for those of you here right now, uh, how familiar are you with uh, some of this? So you got another poll question there. Thank you all for answering that. Okay, somewhat experienced. Great. So that's that's a very quick. Um, so hopefully that'll give you a, at least a little bit of an overview of that uh, for some of the material that we're going to cover later. Um, but of course, as I said before, uh, this could be service metrology itself could be its own workshop. So coming on to indentation and determination of mechanical properties of surfaces. Um, essentially indentation, we press a tip of a known geometry into a surface to produce a permanent deformation to induce uh, plasticity in the surface. Um, and there are various length scales upon which this can happen. The macro scale, um, where we're using um, very large loads, uh, much larger indenters, and then typically measuring the area after indentation as opposed to nanoscale or micro and nanoscale indentation, where you're measuring the um, where you're measuring the projected contact area or estimating the projected contact area. Excuse me a second. And one of the things with nano indentation um, is that you can have various different responses to this. You can have pile up and sink in, which can affect your uh, which can affect uh, your properties. So there are various different types of indenter geometries. Um, a lot of these are used in uh, different things. We have uh, spherical, which is our, our typical kind of Rockwell indenter. This would either be made of you know, steel or tungsten carbide for an actual Rockwell um, an actual Rockwell indenter. Uh, conical or spheroconical. Um, so essentially either having a, a sharp cone or a cone that is ended with a sphere of a known radius. Um, so most often you would see this for uh, micro and nanoscale scratch testing, although you can perform indents with this as well. Uh, there's a Vickers, which is our four-sided pyramid, uh, typically used on the macro and micro scales. Uh, Berkovich, so used in nano indentation. And this is a three-sided pyramid. Um, the reason this is used, a, why we have a three-sided pyramid, it's far easier to finish uh, three sides to the um, uh, to the required sharpness. And also um, one thing to note is that the Berkovich and Vickers share the same uh, depth to contact area ratio, meaning that you can convert between these two. Vickers can be converted into uh, few Pascals. Uh, okay, uh, sorry. Just quick, uh, quick comment there. Uh, RA can be the same for different surface textures, which can result in misinterpretation of results with just the RA values. Uh, yes, that's so. In which case, what are the other roughness parameters that need to be considered for a coating of five microns thick? Um, so, in terms of other RA parameters, um, so I think that's that's probably where you're going to do kind of the this somewhat standard um, standard suite of uh, roughness parameters. Um, so in terms of what can be used, um, let's see, I think that was probably where you're, um, using RQ or the RMS value, uh, RV and RP, essentially the heights above and below and the peak to valley height. So RZ skewness would probably also be quite useful for some additional information on that. Um, that gives you a little bit more of the, from the center line above and below, and essentially how much you have, uh, how much you have between asperities. Those would be what I would recommend. Um, but also, I mean, if you're going to look at uh, various roughness parameters and you want to get, uh, and you want to get a better idea of that, um, extending from 2D to 3D would be very good. Um, that would be, uh, useful because then you can have a 3D map um, that you can compare if you have access to the instrumentation for this. Um, yeah, so there you go. Um, so any other questions? If there's ones I feel I can answer now, I will answer. Otherwise, uh, we'll mark those for later. Um, 
Berkovich uh, cube corner. So we have a much sharper indenter typically used um, for um, impact testing um, to drive failure. And then a noop indenter, which is a much shallower and longer indenter used for brittle materials or thin sheets. Uh, and we have nano indentation. So going on from that to, so this is instrumented indentation. Uh, so effectively we are measuring both the load and displacement throughout the, uh, throughout um, the loading site, loading and unloading cycles. So I just like to do another quick poll question here to ask how familiar you all are with nano indentation. Somewhat experienced, very experienced. Okay, so it's good to, uh, good to see, not at all. Okay, um, once again, if there, if you have any questions on any of this, um, please go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll either try and answer it as I'm going or um, in the Q&A sessions. Uh, nano indents are typically performed quasi-statically, which is um, essentially to say extremely slowly. And our area afterwards is taken as the projected contact area. We can determine this uh, by indentation into calibration materials, uh, such as fused silica. And we can also use this calibration to, uh, to determine our tip sharpness, uh, because this can change um, throughout, uh, throughout the indenter's lifespan. What we have here is a nice little picture, um, of a grid of nano indents and also some, uh, some scratches, which seem to have gone over one of the indent grids there. Um, so we can have various different load displacement features. So one of the things you can have is, uh, this little AC ripple, um, throughout the uh, loading curves. This is essentially, this is the continuous stiffness method. So an AC ripple is imposed over the DC signal that drives the indenter in order to continually uh, measure stiffness throughout loading. Uh, we can have partial unloading. So you can have multiple, um, multiple unload steps and then reload steps throughout an indentation rather than just one single indent. So you can get multiple, um, multiple determinations of hardness with respect to depth. Uh, this can be useful to be to determine the exact load at which a fully plastic zone is formed and also to, uh, to produce a map of hardness with respect to depth, elastic modulus with respect to depth. And then you can extend this to various different um, wear ratios such as H over E, H cubed over E squared and so on. And we can have a hold step at maximum load typically used to check for creep. Um, generally for extremely hard materials, uh, such as diamond like carbon, um, titanium nitride, um, a lot of creep tends to be quite small. Uh, for things like polymers, this can be a lot more of an issue. If you're doing um, high temperature indentation, creep is extremely important because that can, that's, uh, that's determining that your, um, your uh, part is maintaining its geometry well under applied load. So moving on to um, the various different uh, various different ways that we can actually um, determine properties from this, we have the Oliver Farr method. So this determines hardness, um, essentially like uh, like the Mayer's hardness, a maximum load divided by the area for the for nano indentation where areas are projected contact area. Reduced modulus, um, we calculate from the unloading stiffness. So this is our the gradient of our uh, of our uh, unload line. So quick question: They're talking about nano indentation and hardness. What can be the possible way to quantify the hardness of a material harder than diamond? Um, so there there is a very big issue with as soon as you get into um, get into significant uh, proportions of the hardness of diamond in that uh, you may be deforming the diamond itself um, during indentation. Um, one of the ways for this is uh, you can do some um, bits of computational modeling. If you know what the uh, structure of that material is, um, you can then do essentially a virtual indentation that can help you determine uh, what the hardness is. Um, that would probably be the best I could uh, I could I could say right now in terms of how you would even approach that. Um, but yeah, coming back to the uh, 
coming back uh, to these equations here. Uh, so we have our unloading stiffness that we can feed into our uh, elastic modulus. This results in a reduced modulus is because we're only, um, only deforming in uh, nominally one direction. Um, we can then convert this reduced modulus into a, a full modulus uh, for this. So taking into account the uh, Poisson's ratio and elastic moduli, uh, mo elastic modulus of the indenture material. Uh, so our Poisson's ratio being our negative info uh, ratio of transverse strain to axial strain. Um, and then we can get our full elastic modulus. Uh, typically you, you generally see full modulus reported in research papers now, although occasionally you would still see a uh, reduced modulus because if you're dealing with the material where it's quite difficult to determine the Poisson's ratio, excuse me, it's better to uh, better to report what uh, you can actually, we can actually determine. Uh, our area um, for a Berkovich indenture at least, which is our most typical one, uh, 24.5 times the uh, contact uh, contact depth squared. And we can then uh, generate this hardness formula, Pmax divided by 24.5 times Hc squared. So typically, um, you know, if we were, if we perform an indentation on a metal, we would see uh, a nice standard load unload, um, such as what we have for C here for steel, but um, there's a lot of material dependence in these, such as with elastic solids, um, where essentially you don't get any hysteresis at all. There is no, no deformation induced on the surface and therefore the, um, the load displacement will, um, I'll mark that question for uh, for later. Um, sorry, I will get back to that one. Um, just conscious of time as well. Um, so with elastic solids, uh, you get no hysteresis. It will follow the unload. Will follow from the load. Um, for uh, a visco almost viscoelastic response, uh, such as something like fused silica, we get very little hysteresis. Steel, where it's more viscoplastic. And then we can have various different types of phase changes, such as uh, pop outs in crystalline silicon, uh, which is a pressure induced phase change. And then in sapphire, we have pop ins. And then in polymers, uh, creep is such an issue that generally you would uh, you would have issue then doing indentation, um, sorry, measuring your modulus uh, from that, just because your your gradient is going to be uh, is going to be a little messed up from that. Uh, from that creep measurement. So that's generally where you do, uh, you try to unload as slowly as possible. This can deal with some of this uh, creep. And then also just having having that hold step in order that you can get the, um, you can get the creep and most indenter platforms will. Uh, H is the depth of indentation in these graphs, yes. Um, so creep then you can correct for in most indenter platforms. Um, so we have our pop-out features are also seen in coatings, yes. Yes, uh, ISO 14577, um, instrumented indentation standards. This is typically, this is generally for coatings. Um, so this is what you'd see most often um, people doing their uh, measurements too. Uh, defines various different ranges here. You've got macro, micro, and nano. Uh, typically says that indentation should be no more than 10% of the coating thickness. Otherwise, what you're going to see is substrate effects. Uh, however, this is uh, this is just some guidelines. Um, doing multiple indents at multiple loads will help you determine um, where the actual uh, coating properties are. <clears throat> as this this ten percent of coating thickness comes from a, I believe, a nineteen fifty one paper by Buckle, where it was me mentioned as good practice to do no more than ten percent, and various other papers mentioned this ten percent, um, although. A few of a few have said this is uh, this is somewhat of an odd thing as there's no exact physical uh, physical uh, relation for this, and this ten percent I believe when it was done originally um, it was for titanium nitride, or when the standard was generally defined it was titanium nitride on M two tool steel in which case ten percent does work well for that, but not necessarily for other coatings on other materials. Uh, in terms of surface roughness, you should have RA should be less than 5% of the maximum penetrating depth. 
so that you don't get very many roughness effects, and then also to ensure environmental control during indentation. Uh, we have indentation size effects as well. So effectively at low indentation load, generally you, you're not necessarily always going to see an increase in, uh, increase in hardness because you might not necessarily have a fully developed plastic zone, but generally what you would see um, as you decrease, uh, decrease the length scale of your indentation, indent with lower load, you would get this apparent increase in hardness as you're sampling instead of with a lot of materials, polycrystalline, single crystals, and this has been attributed to various things, you know, pile up, work hardening, grin precipitates, or high elastic recovery materials. Coating thickness, there are multiple methods um, to measure this. Um, other one thing I would say, again, there's no one thing that works for everything. The best thing to do is to pick what works best for your sample. Um, often, um, Cross-sectioning is a good method if it's a more difficult sample. Otherwise, if you are able to um, to put um, it's what, what I call sacrificial uh, coating pieces in, um, if you're running coatings, is to then do bulk cratering tests on those. Otherwise, there are uh, a wealth of other methods. Um, SEM, you can re uh, remove methods, mask off part of the area. Um, so then you can do a step height change um ultrasonic extra for fluorescence you can do um as well that's very good to check that your coating is within specification to measure your thickness so uh calo test as i mentioned this is probably the most simple one to do it's a ball cratering test so typically there is steel or tungsten carbide ball is rolled against the surface with a nanocrystalline diamond paste uh in order to help the abrasion here and then you can measure the geometry of the um, the geometry of the wear scar in order to determine your coating thickness. And this is quite an accurate method. Um, it would probably be quite good for your for your samples as well to, um, uh, to check by another method, but for a quick verification, it's very difficult to meet Kawa test. Uh, coating adhesion, uh, there are various different methods of this. Um, I'll come to that question later as well, thank you. Um, so in terms of less adhere, less well-adhered coatings, some things like electroplating, tape adhesion, or a cross-cut and pull-off is quite good. Uh, you can do Rockwell indentation as well and study the cracking around the indentation site. Or scratch testing, which you can come on to. So macro scratch testing, generally progressive loading scratch test. Um, at different, uh, at various loads, you're going to see various different failure parameters. These are dependent upon the, um, the uh, properties of the coatings themselves. You can either have uh, more brittle or more um, or more ductile failure mechanisms, but generally it is quite similar to these, um, where you have different types of spoliation, buckling, chipping, and so on. You can also define a scratch hardness um, of a normal load over the projected contact area. So you just need to be able to contact uh, work out what the projected contact area of your indenter is at any specific point. We can extend that to lower length scales as well with nano scratch testing. Um, this is typically um, taken as a three pass um, technique. So topography, scratch topography. Um, so we can look at what the um, pre-scratch area was like, um, area afterwards, uh, and, well, during the scratch and then afterwards as this allows us to measure depth. And we can then use that uh, to measure contact pressure, yield stress. And then you can also use this for the measurement of interfacial and plowing friction, which is very, very uh, useful for getting to the fundamentals of, um, uh, of interaction between two different surfaces or two different materials. Uh, we'll move on to talk a little bit about metallic grain structure. So as I said before, and as you saw with it, um, with those indentations, uh, typical almost metals are polycrystalline. You can reveal this grain structure with etching. Um, there are specific um, etching formulations for specific metals. Um, I believe uh, Bueller have a really good guide which details most of uh, most of these. You'd be able to find that quite easily. And a lot of these these grains uh, are the result of um, essentially defects or misalign misalignment between um, various different 
single crystals due to um, due to defects. Um, so these can be vacancies, um, interstitial atoms, um, substitution impurities, and typically metallic structures are made up of you know many many of these grains. Um, each metal will have various different grain sizes, and you can get metals with very large grains, such as if you see uh, galvanized steel, the galvanized coating on top has very large grains, what's called a speckle. Um, while we're talking about different types of structures, it have diff various different structures in plasma deposited coatings. Uh, so these can um, these can vary from uh, very large recrystallized grain structures at high temperatures um, of deposition, going towards uh, nanocrystalline regions uh, to more porous uh, tapered columnar structures. Uh, such as what we see here um, with this yttria stabilized zirconium coating. So um, most, a lot of papers specific on coating structures will report the type of structure. And then you can, you can uh, look at various papers such as this one by Andre Anders um, to give you your structure zone model. Uh, a little bit on electron microscopy now. As an electron beam um, interacts with surfaces um, what you get is a, uh, essentially what we call this interaction volume, this sort of, uh, plume, um, at each, uh, at each sort of level, or you can get, uh, different emissions from this, essentially using the electron beam to, uh, to excite the area, um, uh, and then we can measure the emission from that. Uh, this can be both in scanning and tunneling, mo uh, transmission modes, apologies, um, which we'll come to in a little bit. Uh, this interaction volume is complex. There are some papers that are mapping out the path of the electrons through materials. Uh, this is extremely uh, difficult, however. And yeah, generally for any of our spectroscopy generated from electron microscopy, we're looking at the X-rays generated from this or inelastic scattering or scattering of those electrons themselves. So going on to SEM, this is uh, very much a surface morphology sensitive um, uh, type of microscopy. It's generally raster scanning, much more, much higher resolution than optical um, uh, than optical microscopy. Uh, but one thing you need to take care of is sample preparation. Generally, your sample should be conductive; otherwise, you will have to sputter coat them. Um, but there are new methods of electron microscopy, such as environmental SEM, um, essentially allowing observations in low pressure, gaseous environments, and high relative humidities. What we have here is just a picture of, uh, of an impact crater on a diamond-like carbon coating. So this is a micro impact. Focused ion beam typically will be used for, uh, well, you can mill away the surface and also for preparation for transmission electron microscopy. Probably one of the easiest ways is to take a bulk sample, mill it out, remove it to a TEM grid, and then insert that into the transmission electron micro, uh, microscope. Um, these uh, typically have to be quite thin. Uh, less than 100 nanometers would be preferable. Um, typically gallium is used for this. Um, so it's a, a gallium ion source. Um, so the gallium metal is placed uh, in contact with a tungsten needle when heated. Uh, the gallium will wet to the tungsten, and then you can use an electric field in order to direct those gallium ions uh, towards the surface. And these high energy ions will mill away the surface. And typically for, uh, for getting the various different geometries, you, this will, a specific um, electron microscope with uh, tilt with additional tilt functions is used or dual beams would typically be used. We have transmission electron microscopy where our sample is thin enough that our electrons can be transmitted through a sample and their diffraction through that gives us our, uh, gives us our information, um, our um, morphology information, much higher resolution of magnification than SEM. Uh, as I said before, FIB is normally used for the preparation of these samples. Um, we have our, you can see the, uh, the density differences between this tungsten, co tungsten doped and amorphous diamond-like carbon. So going on to various different types of spectroscopy methods, 
Um, so again, this is what I'm going to talk about here. Are, these are not an exhaustive list. This is just some of the techniques you might see uh, for surface studies um, in sort of tribology and surface engineering. But again, specific to you, to other samples, other things may be used. So essentially what all we're doing with spectroscopy is directing electromagnetic radiation towards a sample and measuring uh, the result, uh, absorption, emission, or change in vibrational modes. And some of the things to be aware of with this is, as I said, what type of samples are you analyzing? Um, is it a crystalline or amorphous sample? Because this can deter this can tell you whether to even use a type of characterization method or not. Um, what type of preparation can you uh, can you do with your samples? You know, is it a bulk sample? Is it powder? And also, what type of information do you want to gain? Because each one gives you slightly different information. So, uh, moving on, not necessarily a surface characterization method, but uh, a nice quick characterization methodology is X-ray fluorescence. So, exposure resembled high ray, high energy X-rays. Uh, so this causes electrons to jump at energy shells. And when they return to other energy shells, um, lower energy X-rays are emitted. And these, uh, these energies are specific uh, to the shell uh, which, they, uh, which they have moved from. And this is a very easy method in order to determine uh, essentially what materials your, um, uh, or what elements, excuse me, uh, your material consists of. We can do, uh, yeah, we can get a little more detailed with that, a bit more surface sensitive with secondary ion mass spectroscopy. So you use a focused ion beam to sputter the surface, collect the secondary ions, and then the uh, typical mass spectroscopy, so using their, um, their mass to charge ratios as they deflect uh, through the detector region in order to determine what ion species it is. Uh, we can then have energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. So this is generated, uh, these X-rays are generated in an electron microscope. Um, so essentially as we get, uh, as we get electrons moving between shells, we can get, um, we get uh, maps of uh, what elements there are. You can do point scans, you can do line scans, you can do, uh, you can do maps. We have here is um, an impact, another impact crater. Uh, and essentially the raster scanning of an electron microscope allows you to map out um, where uh, various elements are in your sampling region. Uh, this just requires uh, waiting and um, doing enough uh, sampling in order to, uh, in order to measure, um, measure where these elements are. Uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy, essentially the uh, more of the, the lighter element um, variant, well not necessarily variant, but sort of complementary to um, EDX is eels. So this is much more sensitive to lighter elements. Um, and this energy loss is determined by the inelastic scattering of electrons through a sample. You can get things such as, uh, of course, composition, chemical bonding, valence, and conduction band properties. So we have here are um, so the differences between a crystalline amorph and amorphous carbon, highly oriented polycrystalline graphite, and our hydrogenated amorphous carbon, as well as some of the, uh, the fittings used here. Uh, a note on fittings uh, for different spectroscopy. Each type of spectroscopy will have its own, uh, generally have its own um, uh, fitting function. Um, a lot of these are Gaussian based, um, but um, could be Gaussian plus other functions as well. Um, it is spectroscopy specific. So uh, we go on to Raman. Uh, so talking about different types of, of fitting. So um, these fittings uh, were all made with uh, Gaussian functions because again, this is di these are two diamond-like carbon samples. Um, whereas uh, if you had specifically a crystalline sample, you would use a Lorentzian fitting instead. Um, and the various different features of this Raman can give us different information on the bond disorder, chains, clustering of uh, DLC structures. And of course can be used for um, a lot of other materials, um, such as they're uh, looking for presence of different materials in surface films. 
Um, looking at uh, breakdown of MODTC um, is a big, uh, Raman is extremely useful for that. If you want to x-ray diffraction, if you're looking um, specifically for crystalline samples, uh, essentially look at the uh, Bragg law, so incident x-rays and diffracted x-rays. So the, uh, the angles that we measure from these are specific to the, uh, to the lattice spacing of each material. And with that, uh, we can then map out what materials are. Uh, continuing with diffraction, uh, various different types of electron diffraction, such as uh, selected area diffraction in TEM. So you can have either spots or rings with this. So single crystals and many crystals. Um, you can have, if you have more diffuse patterns, you have an amorphous sample. And then you can have electron backscatter diffraction where we keep our electron beam stationary and tilt the sample. So uh, essentially these, these electrons are then projected onto um, fluorescent screens and they can be false colored in order to, to give you uh, what the orientation of the, uh, of the specific grains are. Uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, extremely surface sensitive. This is essentially based on the photoelectric effect um, of bombarding a surface with X-rays. And uh, the energy of these electrons gives you the binding, uh, the binding energy for um, uh, various different samples. This is, a, this is an example here of pure copper, but you'll probably get um, a uh, mix if you have you know, alloys or coatings that consist of multiple materials. Uh, you can get elements present, uh, chemical state, uh, electronic structure, uh, bonding, density of electronic states. So very, uh, it's a fantastic technique, uh, but you have to take care with your surface preparation. It has to be an extremely clean surface. So that's all of my material for now. So, I, um, but uh, I'll answer the couple of questions that we've got, and then also talk about our, our next webinar. So what we'll like to do, um, you can visit the Surface Ventures website, which I'll bring up. Uh, there you go. You'll be able to register for this next webinar on the 22nd of July, 2 p.m. BST, with uh, Professor Alan Matthews, of the University of Manchester. This is on publishing in the surface technology field. Um, but before you all disappear for that, so please open that in another tab and come back. We're not uh, we're not quite done yet. Um, so uh, I'll answer the two questions that we got, um, and then. Uh, we'll move on to talking about uh, the different um, uh, the different instruments that we're going to have a demo of quite shortly. Okay, so the first one here: uh, how to verify the obtained hardness for nano indentation is correct? Like my silicon nitride coating showing it is 1.4 gigapascals, which isn't the case. Uh, so how to recalculate? Check the issue. So for low hardness value, right? There would be a few things you would want to check. One is um, do an indentation into a reference sample, uh, one that you know the behavior of, something like fused silicon or tungsten carbide, um, in order to check that the hardness measurement you get from that is what you expect. Also, to do a, uh, a tip calibration to check that the, uh, the sharpness is what you expect it to be. Um, that should tell you whether there are any issues with your tip. Um, you can then check that the power law fitting um, that you have for that tip is correct. Um, once you have that, you should be able to tell whether this data is correct. Uh, also, you know, if you can spare the sample to do multiple indents, I would do indents over a range of loads as that will tell you what the hardness response is with respect to applied load. That should help you. Um, obviously, silicon nitride, you know, should be far harder than that. So it's 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 something in your in your methodology there. I hope that's helpful. Um, we have another one here. So, how precise uh, the crater methods on measuring thickness? Um, uh, quite precise. So when I was uh, when I was doing mine, I had uh, diamond like well, at least for micron. Coatings, ball cratering is excellent. I had uh, DLC coatings between two and five microns for the top layer. 
um, and upon checking this with focused ion beam, uh, the Kawa test was absolutely spot on. Uh, the thicker it gets, um, the more difficult um, it gets uh, to do a ball cratering test, just because you need to you need to to run the the ball against the sample for longer. You probably have to replenish the nanocrystalline diamond paste, and the, then there is the likelihood that you begin um, really abrading the surface and pulling off bits of material that you don't want. That's going to make it. Um, uh, quite difficult um, to look at the geometry afterwards. Uh, can we use Kawa test for submicron coatings? Just saw that one quickly. Uh, yes, uh, there are various different uh, geometries of balls available. Uh, you just have to adjust your abrading time um, accordingly. So it is a destructive technique. So, and a little bit of it is knowing the sample um, and what time and rotation speed to apply. Uh, got another one here. Do you have any advice to obtain or to extract the toughness and strength of the material from the continuous stiffness method? For example, the intermetallic compound, which can't be produced as a large specimen. Uh, okay. Um, so in terms of hardness and strength, um, so what you can do, there are ways in order to extract um, yield strength from a sample toughness in terms of you could you can extract metrics to measure fracture toughness um, from your sample um, so essentially indentations you can use for um, uh, for toughness and then you, you can get uh, yield strength as well from that that's um, so I, I don't have that information to hand but um, if uh, you, I'm sure we could, uh, I'm sure we'll be able to find it. If not, uh, you can email me. Sa uh, so it's sam at surfaceventures.org. Uh, I could help you afterwards if you are really struggling to find this. Okay. Uh, got one, I'll take uh, this one last question before I move into the next section of this. So that is, polishing a surface to produce the RA before measuring hardness with a nano indenter can cause overestimation of hardness. Due to surface tensions induced during polishing, um, I would expect this this effect to be minimal. Um, you're not really, unless you're dealing with a sample that's going to uh, that's going to massively work hard, and, and you're doing a lot of um, a lot of polishing. Um, uh, yeah, you would generally get. I don't think you would get a lot of this. Um, again, sample dependent. Um, during polishing. The main thing with polishing is you just you do it uh, gradually, you know, in stages, working through your um, working through your grit. Say you're on a rotary polisher. If you have an extremely rough sample, you know, level it first with the um, with a smaller grit paper. Move into higher grits um, in order to get it uh, to get it extremely you know as smooth as required. Again, if you're doing ISO standard um, RA less than five percent. Um, but yeah, I would say that unless you're dealing with a work hardening sample, it'd be minimal. A uh, quick question there on is uh, pop out features in nano indentation always used to pressure based phase transformations? Uh, yeah, electro. Sorry to to jump around a little bit, but yeah, electro polishing could um, if you're if you're concerned about your sample, there is always electro polishing. And um, pop out features aren't always due to that. If you have a columnar structure, it could be due. To, if you have, uh, um, well, it could be part of the coating, you know, if you have something compressed, um, it could be it. Uh, moving back, pop in, um, could be a collapse of a columnar structure perhaps. So it's not always pressure based phase changes, but for, for, single, um, for single materials or for materials where it is, you can be relatively sure it is a, a bulk sample. It's generally um, phase transformations. So uh, move on now to talking about some of the um, uh, Brooker materials. What I would like to do is uh, is to put up another quick poll question there. Um, essentially, just would you like to receive any any further information from Brooker about their products and events? Uh, so Brooker uh, have a lot of different metrology equipment uh, from atomic force microscopes um, of various different types, um, nanoscale IR spectroscopy, nanomechanical test instruments. Um, one of which we're going to be uh, we will be demoed the TI nine eighty nano indenter, three uh, D optical and stylus profilometers. Um, 
is the Contour X systems, NP Flex. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of that, we also have um, some information here on one of Brooker's next uh, workshops, specific on optical roughness uh, metrology based on the MP Flex. So if you are interested in that, please go ahead and uh, please go ahead and click that. But again, please don't close close your windows away. We're uh, we're still going. <laughs> um, also, tribology and mechanical testing equipment, such as the Tribal Lab. Um, moving on to specifically to surface metrology technologies, uh, we can split these, as I said, into contact and non-contact. So, in terms of uh, contact methods, um, stylus profilometers, atomic force microscopes, and then in non-contact, you have things like the Alicona and the Contour. Um, specifically the contour is based on white light interferometry, which has, and it has a range um, of different features. Um, well, white light interferometers generally. So we have here uh, various MP flexes and various contour models. Um, so you can sample large areas with stitching. Uh, it's fully automated stitching. You do uh, a lot of this for wafer or industrial um, uh, types of applications. Uh, operation of the white light, uh, white light interferometer. Uh, so we have an LED source uh, that is directed. So we have a light source directed through a beam splitter, uh, through a microscope objective down onto a surface. And essentially, any deviations of this of these two beams produces constructive and destructive interference as the beams interact with the surface. Different. As these, um, we can essentially think of this as as these uh, deviate from a uh, from a reference surface. Uh, we're able to map out by the patterns of these constructive be constructive and destructive interference what the surface structure is, and this is this is reflected back up into a digital camera, and then we can extract the data from that. So as I said, uh, so this so we generally change these uh, these beams, this moiré patterns, uh, by changing the uh, changing the focus. So moving moving this um, up and down in order to get z height, and then you can use this coherence length of white light in order to get the z height itself. So this changes our moiré pattern as we see on the pictures going down the uh, going down the right. Um, similarly, you can think of that like with an optical microscope or a confocal microscope when you're turning the focus, uh, turning the focus knob, uh, you will get different sections of this, uh, in focus at a time that a confocal microscope can take and go, okay, I know what, I know what sections of this are in focus. You can build up topography from that. Uh, instead, white line interferometry works by, uh, the intensity of these, uh, moiré patterns by, to be able to tell what parts are in focus. Uh, there are various different benefits to this. It has uh, grit ver uh, vertical resolution, um, grit lateral resolution as well. Uh, generally, we're not limited on what types of surface it is. You can do long working distances. <clears throat> um, the only thing is just to make sure that your sample can fit um, into, the, uh, uh, into the interferometer. Um, but again, there are different sizes for these depending on what you need to image. Um, and this is a, a good, um, it's a certified technique and it's quite easy to, to check that what you're looking at is correct. Uh, and various different, um, uh, various different applications to this manufacturing, optics, films and coatings, uh, tribology, MEMS and sensors. Um, so I'll release the data sheet for the Contour X500 if you're interested, in, uh, interested in taking a look at that. We have the Hyzotron indenters, so the TI Premier, which is the uh, slightly more compact version, and the TI 980, which we're getting a demo of quite soon. Um, so this has various different techniques in it. So we have case static nano indentation. We can do scratch, um, wear, sc essentially scanning wear, quite similar to how an AFM would do. Um, you can use the um, SPM in order to do 
friction imaging to look at coefficient of friction with different areas, modulus mapping, conductive imaging. Um, there are also various other things in there. It can do heated stage, electrical characterization, fluorescence, uh, co-localized Raman. All these are options with this um, uh, piece of equipment. There's dual sensing heads. So a, a an extremely low load 10 million Newton transducer for um, essentially truly nano indentation, uh, low noise floor, and then the scanning probe to allow you to map this afterwards. So again, different um, different forces that can be used after that, um, and across various different scales. And another thing I wanted to mention is, as well as nano indenters, you can step that you can take this. Um, you can take this down even uh, even smaller scale to pico indenters. A lot of these are module specific for uh, electron microscopes, so you can do in situ indentation within an SEM or TEM as well, which is great. I've just released the data sheet for the TI nine eighty. And now let's move on to our demos. So uh, what I'd like to do first is uh, invite Yaroslav uh, Lukes of Brooker to uh, come on stage. And I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Hello. Hi, Sam. Oh, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and leave stage and let you, uh, let you go ahead and, uh, and take it away with the demo. All right. So let me share. Uh, let me share my screen. Mm. So I'm, I'm Yaroslav. I'm working as an application scientist for Brooker Isotron products. Uh, I'm based in Prague. I have our, our our my demo lab with a with a tribo indenter. So I'm running a running a samples for customers. I'm also demonstrating the instrument and doing the application support for our customer base. Uh, I'll have a short time to demonstrate the basic uh, capabilities of a tribo indenter. So a tribo indenter is a standalone uh, platform system that can do uh, in situ SPM images, uh, indentation, scratch test. And I'm going to demonstrate the combination of a, a scanning probe microscopy and indentation. And also uh, I'm going to do a, a map uh, over a sample area. So sample that I uh, that I picked for today is a, is a cross section of a belt. Uh, so we see uh, different structures uh, in there. So we see a precipitates, we see a hard and soft uh, soft uh, phases. So soft phase is basically the uh, like um, a steel matrix, and then we have some uh, precipitates and a hard phase or carbides uh, in the uh, in the in the, in, the, in, the, in this uh, soft matrix here. So initially, or uh, let's say all our instruments or where it all started, uh, we, we integrated our um, sensor that measures force and displacements uh, to an AFM platform. And basically this, this uh, idea of scanning indentation is always uh, or goes with the Hyzitron instrument all the, all the time. So now the standalone platform systems, uh, they have a scanner and our transducer is mounted directly to the scanner. So that allows us to do um, a topography scan before we do an indentation. Right? So we, uh, we use a piezo scanner uh, to go along the sam sample surface at the low contact force. So currently we do two micronewton contact force. With the same in uh, with the same tip that we are going to use for uh, for indentation, so uh, we don't need to move anywhere. So basically, the, the sample stays at this position. We use a scanner to to see the topography and visualize the phases, and then we can use a scanner to position and target these specific phases. So since 1992, that was always the uh, workflow with our instrument. So you uh, focus on your sample surface with the optics or just approach with the tip, and then you scan uh, scan the surface area. And then you can use a piezo automation. Uh, so if I go to automation, uh, click script, I'm going to clear this uh, these previous uh, tests. And then I just you just basically click, uh, click here, uh, click there and we can run a piezo automation, which basically 
uh, means uh, let me actually cancel that for now and that means that we move the piezo uh, to the specific position and make an indent now let's look at the load function so i'm going to use the, the the most simplest one or the most simple one uh, we call it trapezoidal it has a load segment hold segment and unload segment i'll do both uh, all sec uh, actually load and unload segment in five seconds and then i have two seconds for uh for hold so um, it's confirmed that the load function is correct so i can go back to automation and i just click run piezo automation say yes a load function is correct and then i'm gonna just define a folder where i'm gonna uh, save those uh, uh, data files and let's call it world and save it and now i have a, a um, okay capability or I can I can still define what would be the maximum force um, for uh, my two indents so actually the first indent will be at hard face so I can actually uh, use a five millinewton force let's say and the the other one will be in a uh, in a steel matrix so I can actually keep uh, 1000 micronewton so one millinewton force so I just click continue and now uh, piezo moves uh, Piezo moves my tip uh, to the first position here. And uh, there are some uh, settling times uh, to uh, achieve a thermal equilibrium and reduce a thermal drift. But for now, I'm going to skip those uh, settling times and just move on to, um, uh, to indentation. Uh, we measure drift uh, before each indentation. So we measure a drift rate. Uh, so ideally, drift rate is in 0.05 nanometers per second uh, which means that our test is um, will be done in 12 seconds uh, so if we reach this ideal uh, drift rate then the error uh, in the in um, uh, depths will be uh, 0.5 nanometers only right so we can uh, we can either um, leave it leave it running or uh, we can also skip that one uh, then there was a little bit of lift height before, so we were in the in a slight contact with the sample. Then we lift the probe and approached again. Now we load, we are loading the probe uh, and the sample, so it was penetrating into the material, and now we are unloading. So this is the load function, and then in the analysis we can actually look at the uh, the indentation curve itself. So we see that at five millinewton contact, uh, uh, contact force or maximum force. Uh, we reached uh, over a 100 nanometer indentation displacement and then unloading. Uh, so we unloaded up to, um, uh, or let's say the residual indentation depth is about 70, 70 nanometers. And this, so from 70 to 115 or 19, that's the elastic recovery of a material. So that's the elastic deformation that, uh, that went back. And from the unloading uh, segment, we can get the elastic modules or the information about the elasticity because uh, unloading the data contains the information about the elastic recovery here. So if I simply click execute fit, it, uh, it will proceed with the Oliver and Fire analysis, takes the green data points, uh, uh, fit the power law function, uh, measures the uh, slope, tangential line to uh, to these green data points or to the, to the fitted uh, curve and which is uh, and this tangential line or slope is called contact stiffness and from the contact stiffness and known contact area at that position uh, we have a reduced modules and indentation hardness uh, values here so if i go back to the automation uh, we can skip another uh, settling time we can also uh, we can either wait or we can so this this time the drift will be or drift rate will be very very low uh, in 10 seconds it doesn't move almost anywhere so basically uh, we can skip that too and now again we are in the second position uh, lift the probe of 50 25 nanometers approach back and then uh, and now we make the indentation uh, with a one millinewton force uh, to the uh, to the steel matrix, or we expect that this uh, could be a, a lower hardness, lower modulus. So we made the two indents. Now the scan is automatically running. 
So it's scanning the area where we did the indentation. And we can take a look at the uh, at the indentation curves. So if I mm, plot both curves in the same graph, you can see the differences. So this is the high load indent into the uh, into the the hard face. Uh, this is the low uh, low load indent into the softer face. Um, we see. Uh, the, uh, the differences in the indentation curve and uh, from the unloading segment we can get the uh, we can get the modules and hardness but actually in this case in this case uh, i would expect that the modules will be about the same because the shape of the unloading seg uh, segment is actually also very much uh, similar uh, but hardness should be very much different so in this case we have two, 245 uh, gigapascal for uh, modules, hardness 7.19. Uh, 7 if I switch back here, uh, we have actually almost the uh, hardness is almost uh, almost double times higher than the uh, than the soft face, although that the the modules uh, stayed almost the same. Right? So it's about the same same value. We also see a pop in here. Uh, which could be related or which is definitely related to the plastic deformation. Uh, so uh, it's either a, a crack or actually a dislocation burst or uh, dislocation propagates in, in that phase or through, the, uh, through the crystalline lattice. And then the load uh, or deformation continue and unload. So if I go back to the imaging, uh, we see an indent, a small indent, 50 or 60 nanometers uh, actually so let's uh, let's look at that so uh, the the higher load uh, one uh, the residual indentation depth is 70 nanometers uh, low uh, low load indent was 40 nanometers so we have a residual indentation here about uh, 40 nanometers and then at some point we might see an indent in the in the face uh, here so this was a <clears throat> this was a, a very traditional approach, uh, and also his, I would all already say it, it it is a historical approach. Uh, so we are we always cared about the uh, indentation curve. How does it look like? And actually about a single indentation curve, right? So you can derive uh, information from uh, from the indentation single indentation curve about your sample. Uh, I would say two or three years ago, uh, we introduced um, uh, high-speed mapping, so we can uh, we can synchronize the piezo piezo motion with a with our transducer. So while the scanner is moving along the sample surface, the sensor for force displacement sensor can make the indentation. So we can do it in very fast manner. And so this load function we call XPM, accelerated property mapping, and basically it's a uh, it's a single load function, uh, but it's it's a map. So you you program a grid of indents. Uh, it's each indent still has a trapezoidal shape, so it has three segments: a load, hold, and unload. But you do uh, you do those uh, segments very fast in 0.1 seconds only. So in this case, I have a 15 by 15 indents with one micrometer separation at the maximum force of 800 micronewton. So we do a small indentation uh, because, and then uh, the, because the plastic deformation uh, under the indent, uh, indenter is small and therefore we can reach high resolution, uh, high, re uh, high resolution hardness and modulus maps on the sample surface or on, a, on, a, on, a, uh, on your area of interest. So now the piezo automation finished, and so I can simply click here, perform XPM. And now we'll be mapping the same area uh, that, we, uh, that we used before for targeted indents. So I just click start, uh, engage, yes. So now the tip is engaging to the sample. Uh, it will reach the uh, contact point or contact set point of two micronewton. And then again, a piezo scanner will move 
uh, to the first position and we will run an indent in lines. So there is a 45 seconds for cycling time. So I can skip, skip that for now. And now we see a real time image. So each loop is a, is, is a single indent. Right? Uh, this, this is basically a plot of our load function. The white stripes here means uh, it, uh, that that's actually a time needed to move the tip to the, to the next line. And uh, you can't really see it, but there is a load hold and unload in there in 0.1 seconds. And here we have a displacement versus time. So we actually see what is the indentation depth. And you also see that the, so this is each line of indents. So there is a little tilt on our cerebral sur surface, uh, which actually, uh, which is also visible here. So we are not moving out of contact. So our tip is still, or is, it's always in the contact with the sample surface and just the transducer, the force displacement sensor makes the indentation. Right. So that's uh, that's how we do it. So it's a synchronized um, synchronized signal between the piezo and our electro electrostatic transducer. Uh, so we can we can have a and later uh, we can have a correlation between the uh, SPM scan, so between the topography scan, to be, uh, and the mechanical data. So you can directly correlate the mechanical properties with the different phases uh, that you have in your heterogeneous material. So this technique is, has been widely uh, applied now for, for any sample because it's very fast. So those, uh, those of you who, who has some experience with indentation, um, uh, you, you know that just 100 indents uh, takes more than an hour. And now we did 225 indents uh, in less than um, two minutes and the test is done. Right? So uh, I did two indents in the, uh, with the piezo automation and basically with the same time, uh, I, I was able to finish 250 in 55, uh, 225 indents. And I'll, I'll, and of course I will have uh, more information uh, from from the sample, because I I would already see uh, the distribution of different phases and at least approximately what are the mechanical properties. So you can really tune tune the parameters uh, very fast, and you 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 see uh, what is your sample about. So let me analyze the data. So if I um, load the file that we just measured in the software, it asks about the, what was the contact force? I mean, it's not transferred yet. And uh, as you can see, since we applied a single load function, we also saved a single file. So now all these 225 indents are within the one file. So now the routine goes through that file and separate each individual indentation curve uh, and calculates the uh, elastic modules or reduced elastic modules and hardness from the unloading segment. So already from, uh, you, can, you can see a differences between the different phases. So we see a soft phase here and we see a super hard phase here uh, that, that's almost uh, elastic deformation, though there is always almost no residual information, something in between. So we just need to wait until the analysis is done. And uh, then uh, we can take a look uh, on, the, uh, on the results. But let me go back to the, uh, to the initial software. Okay, so now it's, uh, now it's done. So uh, we see a distribution of, uh, of uh, properties, so especially for hardness, right? So uh, the hardness values shows the different uh, hard phases. And then uh, in the modules, it's almost about the same, uh, but the hardness is very different for, met uh, for metallic samples. Uh, so we were actually pushed by, pushed by the users in, in that field uh, to really develop a fast hardness mapping. 
so that's all what I wanted to show. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much for the demo. That mapping capability is spectacular. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, what we'll do now is we'll, um, we'll just swap over to uh, our next demo. So I'll go ahead and invite Vishal on stage, who will be uh, dem demoing the uh, contour white light interferometer. Hi, everyone. Okay, uh -huh. swap over to that. So, right. Thank you very much, Sam. So I'm gonna show you uh, very briefly how we do measurements on the Contour X500. So you can see here, this is the instrument uh, that I'm sitting next to. And uh, this particular setup, it's an automated stage, automated turret, a range of objectives. So we can do quite a lot uh, with the system here. Uh, so let's see, let's, have a, let's play a little game. So I have my iPhone here and we can measure the surface roughness of the screen here. You can see it's real, it definitely turns on. And while I set this up to do the measurement, I want all of you to put in the chat, how rough do you think the screen is? So go ahead and do that. And uh, while we do that, I'm just gonna put it inside the thing. I can see it. it's a little bit dusty. All right. And also I'm gonna share my screen so you can see the software as well. Okay, good. So I'm still not seeing any answers, come on. Oh, and I want to see every one of you type in the chat how rough do you think the screen is? So I'm seeing some numbers come in. People are saying RZ of 50 nanometers, 10 nanometers, 50 nanometers, between 100 and between 50 nanometers. Okay. You still have a few more seconds left. So keep your guesses coming in and I'm just gonna carry on talking. So you can see on screen here, uh, these interference fringes. So this is what Sam was talking about earlier on because we have an interferometer here effectively. Uh, you can see as I change the focus, you can see different parts of the sample are coming into focus. And what the system is doing is it's gonna look at every single pixel and it's gonna plot the modulation of this uh, moiré pattern and from that, we can determine the roughness uh, of the surface or at least the form of the surface. So let's do a measurement, I can still see. Okay, so a lot of you are saying it's gonna be uh, sort of 10 and several hundred nanometers. So let's do a measurement here. You can see now it's doing the scan on the left here. You saw the fringes go by. On the right, it's done the plot of the 3D map itself. And uh, now it's just processing the data and we will see what the surface looks like. There you go, so this is the surface. And actually, unfortunately, all of you are completely uh, completely wrong. <laughs> uh, so the roughness here is actually less than three nanometers. And this is one point I wanna make. We had a question at the start of the workshop uh, where uh, we had a user ask, when you do roughness measurements, uh, the, the profile, so this is my amazing paint skills. So depending on how you measure the profile, the value can be very different. So let's say I take a red line cross section across like this, these circle features, uh, well, these uh, oblong features, they are, let's say, holes in my surface. So if I do a, uh, an extraction horizontally like this versus if I extract uh, diagonally like this in the orange or, or in the blue line profile, they're gonna give me very different values for the RA because yeah, you're effectively sampling a very different surface in that case. So it becomes very, it depends on the surface. If you have a homogeneous surface, then yeah, it works. But in, in a surface like this, where you have features that are especially in different directions, then the RA value is very different. So for this reason, we actually like to quote SA, which is taking into account the surface roughness in both direction, in X and Y. And so it doesn't matter about the rotation of the sample, this is, uh, this is a much more meaningful value. So this is one way to uh, to analyze your your surface is by looking at the 2D roughness, which in this case is SA. But yeah, you can see this screen is actually quite smooth. Uh, it's it's yeah, it's less than three nanometers, and I have an even smoother sample here, which is actually one of our silicon carbide flats, which go to around 0.1 nanometers in uh, in SA. So yeah, you're, you're touching uh, quite smooth things all the time. Uh, I have another sample here that we can look at. 
so this is now on the opposite of the length scale. So this is actually uh, a turning surface. And I could even put it into the instrument. So let's see. I'll change my sample here. So I'll get rid of my phone. And I have uh, I basically have this, uh, this type of book, which has uh, several different types of machine surfaces here. So we're going to look at one of the turning surfaces. So if I just put it down there. And let's come down. Okay. And I'm going to use a higher magnification objective here. So let's go on a 10x objective before we were using a 5x objective. So you see here now the surface is coming into focus. And as we go down, you can actually see the fringes now appearing on the surface as well. So let's do a measurement here. So if I click measure, I'm just going to use this measurement here. So now again, on the left, you see the fringes go past the moire fringes on the right. You see the actual 3D surface being uh, acquired here. And now again, it's processing data. And you see here, uh, just within a few seconds, you can see what the surface looks like. So. And in this case, my SA is uh, 1.4 microns. So now we are basically three orders of magnitude higher in surface roughness. But it takes the same amount of time to measure either surface. And again, you have very high accuracy here because we're using an interferometer. We have a question here. How reliable are the measurements under 10 nanometers when using white light? They're actually very reliable. Uh, we've done studies where we've looked at a 5 micron step height sample. And if we do 20 measurement and we look at the repeatability of that step height measurement, we get uh, a standard deviation that is around two to three nanometers uh, on a five micron step. So actually, yes, it's, uh, it's very reliable. And the system itself, this is capable of measuring down to less than 0 0.1 nanometer in, in, in step height features. So yes, it's uh, incredibly reliable. But yeah, this is the, the surface in, 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 in a 3D shape. Uh, in the interest of time, I will uh, just show you a couple of other examples uh, that I've collected earlier on today. So this is a scratch test. So this is actually on a piece of glass slide. So you can see in the uh, in the camera here, uh, there are a bunch of uh, uh, scratch tests on here. And uh, uh, this is actually a stitched image that's showing you along the length here. So if I just zoom in, you can see it starts from here somewhere. And as we go further down, the load is increasing on the scratch. So it gets deeper and deeper. And then at some point, the glass uh, just cannot uh, bear the weight from uh, the pressure from the, uh, from the indenter. And all of a sudden, it starts to fracture and break apart. And this is what you're seeing here. And actually, Sam showed some examples of this uh, earlier on, albeit uh, with a different technique uh, as they were measuring here. But uh, yeah, you can see exactly what this looks like. So a useful analysis in here would be to, let's say, measure the depth here, measure maybe measure the volume. So you can do that. We have this type of functionality within the software here within Vision 64. So you can see here uh, the, the volume that's inside of this uh, scratch test. It's uh, basically uh, 0 0.01 cubic millimeters. So it's a fairly deep surface in, in, the, in the scale of things here. Uh, also, we can do things, uh, basic things like cross sections, for instance. So you can see here cross sections across the horizontal. So you can see the depth here is just over 50 microns from the top surface. Um, and then this is the cross section across the vertical direction here. And actually, you could even see some locations where the surface is coming up. Uh, so it's actually. Uh, being raised. And if I go back into the 3D view here, uh, it's a little bit easier to show you. So you can see here the surface is coming up. And that's because, uh, yeah, we are basically causing uh, quite severe damage to the, the piece of glass here. And actually, you could even see smaller fractures before it completely fell apart. So that's what you're seeing uh, here a little bit. So there's a lot you can do there. Another question we have here uh, is the is measure varies with operating environment condition, temperature, and humidity? It can. Uh, ideally, you want to keep this instrument in a nice, stable environment. So at least try to keep the temperature stable, uh, humidity. Uh, sure, you don't want it to condense anywhere. Otherwise, it will, 
you know, start to affect the, the quality of the objective on the surfaces. But uh, yeah, you want to keep the temperature stable, plus or minus one degree, because the interferometer is, is again, very accurate. So you don't want to, you don't want it to cause any drift. Uh, just to carry on moving, uh, uh, this is uh, another surface that's just been uh, polished. And again, you can see the surface roughness here is about one and a half micrometers. So we can go all the way from nano to micro and uh, it's not a problem. Uh, we have a couple of the questions here. Is the NPFLEX reliable to perform analysis on solid white color PE polymer? Yeah, so NPFLEX, it actually is uh, also on the same technology, which is white light interferometry. Uh, the only difference being that it's a much larger system. So you have a, a much larger area for you to put even things like engine blocks inside. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the the capability, yes, it's it's uh, very uh, it's basically the same as the, this uh, tabletop system. Uh, and then, is there any chance to measure a sample where the reflection uh, of light back, let's say, is very poor, so maybe a dark matte colored sa uh, uh, finished sample? Yeah, you can do that. So we can uh, we have examples of measuring um, uh, matte surfaces as well. Vibration, yes, a very good uh, good question. Vibrations can have an effect. So the system that I have here, this is actually sitting on an air isolation table. So you, you so you want to remove any vibrations uh, coming in through the floor and even acoustic a little bit. Uh, so yeah, they can have an effect. Uh, so you need to be a little bit careful about that one. One final example that I want to show you here is uh, capability to measure thicknesses. So we so we can measure actually film thicknesses with this instrument as well. So for instance, if you take a soda can and uh, you cut it up and on the inside of the soda can there will be a coating uh, to stop the uh, let's say liquid coming into contact with the aluminium directly so we can actually measure that thickness coating uh, and this is the measurement that i've done here already uh, and you can see the step height in this case is around three and a half uh, four microns in this particular location so this is the actual surface here i've actually deliberately scratched the coating here so you can see but we can also uh, do a thickness stat. And in this case, it's actually giving you the average thickness, which is around three and a half microns and maximum, minimum and range and so on. So you can, yeah, you can also characterize thicknesses. In this case, typically if your thickness is, uh, let's say more than a micron, it's pretty straightforward to characterize this. You just simply need to know the refractive index. And even if you don't, you can do a quick calibration measurement as well. Uh, but you can go down to measuring thicknesses on the range of about 200 nanometers. Uh, so there's there's some nice capability there as well. And really the way it works is essentially it looks as two different surfaces, the fringe from the bottom of the uh, interface and then the top of the coating itself. And it can separate those two out effectively. So that's a very quick overview of how we do measurements on the contour uh, of, uh, of the system. If you have any questions, please drop me an email and uh, I can definitely help you out with that. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, do have another couple of questions coming in there. Um, so if we go ahead and we bring Yaroslav back as well, because I think there was one specifically for him. Great. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so let's go. Where's our earlier question? I think I had one. Uh, had one here on what material was being examined um, in the Hyzotron. Yeah. So there was a cross section of welt. So basically, a, a di two different types of steel. Mm, steel is actually. So this was a welt material. So actually, it was a. It was a steel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, Go on here. Any even rough estimation of the price? I think for the someone's someone's eyeing up the contour there. And uh, what is the biggest sample that can be accommodated? So on the NPFlex, uh, samples can be quite large. Uh, mm -hmm. They can be as big as an en engine block, for instance, yep. uh, because you have a very large open space uh, available there. On a system like this, on a smaller system here, uh, the head can go all the way up to about a hundred, about ten centimeters. So you have, uh, yeah, you have a pretty, uh, let's say, deep uh, sample surface here that you can uh, you can examine. In terms of X, Y dimensions, the stage mm -hmm. itself can move about one fifty by one fifty millimeters. But you can put something a little bit larger there as well. Yeah. So you can just see the head coming up here. So yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Um, I think the other thing was um, rough, rough price of a contour system. Yeah, so it depends on the configuration. Uh, if you have a fully loaded system like this, it can get uh, a little bit pricey with you know yeah. five fixes and everything. Sure, sure. But typically, they start from about uh, I think a very basic system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just over a hundred thousand pounds or so, maybe yeah. hundred twenty. Yeah. But yeah, I guess if I uh, go ahead and put the, well, I think more. Well, <clears throat> I just put up the uh, the website. There's more more information on the website, and I think people should be able to get. Uh, get uh, quotes for that if they're interested there <clears throat> excuse me sorry uh, another question can I measure surface roughness and thickness on diamond like carbon films deposited on silicon substrate uh, yeah you can uh, you do need to be a little bit careful with how thick your coating is uh, and also on silicon where you have the oxide layer as uh, this, uh, uh, the different refractive indices of these different uh, coatings, they can have an effect. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can uh, you can measure. Yeah. Uh, is it necessary to have a scratch on the coating um, slash coating removal to find the thickness via white light interferometry? Not necessarily. If you know the refractive index. Uh, and, and the properties of the material, mm -hmm. then yeah, the software can uh, simply just take that into account. But if you don't know the N uh, refractive index, then yeah, you can do a calibration mm -hmm. by having a scratch, for instance. Yeah. I think this is our, our final question here. Uh, depth of field for the optical system? So they, so typically we like to, we will actually want to have a very, uh, let's say a very long or very uh, long depth of field because then that helps with uh, measuring the fringes, especially for uh, for the film thickness measurements. But if we use something like the 50x or the 115x objective, the NA uh, aperture, mm -hmm. the numerical aperture of the objective is actually quite high, typically 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So in that case, the depth of field is very shallow. And actually, this can work to your advantage if you have a surface with many different coating thicknesses and you want to just look at the top surface, then you can use these high NA objectives and reduce your depth of field. So the fringes come from just the top surface. So they can play to your advantage, uh, but you, you, yeah, you can use either or. Great, thanks. Uh, I think that's it for the, uh, for the questions. Uh, so it'll, we just covered those. So we'll come to the uh, close of the workshop. Um, Vishal and Yaroslav, thank you very much for the uh, for the fantastic demos today. That was uh, they were great uh, great to see. Um, um, yep, yeah, for for anyone um, who wants to check out other um, Service Ventures uh, events, upcoming ones, and also look back at um, our previous events, uh, you can do that on our website, uh, serviceventures.org. We'll also bring up the um, registration link uh, for our next event uh, with Professor Alan Matthews on the 22nd of July. So uh, please do go ahead and register for that. Um, and and I, Sam, I also just want to say that we also have actually another workshop coming up on the NP Flex in particular. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, so uh, maybe I just quickly share my screen here. Absolutely. So you can see, uh, this is happening on the 13th of July mm -hmm. uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, uh, European time. Mm -hmm. So please go on to the website and uh, yeah, we have the, uh, the workshop on that as well. This is geared towards sort of industrial parts, uh, medical mm -hmm. parts, that kind of stuff. All right. Fantastic. Well, that'll be another, uh, <laughs> be another great workshop there. So uh, brilliant. Yeah. Um, yes. So thank you. Uh, thank you both. And yeah, and also just generally I'd say thank you to uh, to Brooker for this. We wouldn't be able to uh, wouldn't be able to run events like this without uh, without your support. So thank you and thank you again for the demos. And with that, we'll uh, we'll close out today. So uh, thank you all for listening, everyone. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. All right. Have a good day. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.